Okay, Marv. How's life, Marv? <laughs> it's been great. I'm enjoying it. I've been very fortunate. Still, still active. Still exercising every day, and and enjoying visiting with people like you. What's your normal day like these days? What do you do? Well, um, after breakfast, I, an hour walk every day, and about ten times during that, I'll trot maybe a hundred step, a hundred yards, I should say, and. Um, and about three days a week, I'll lift weights. Other than that, a lot of reading. I've done some writing. I've written three or four books. Uh, we get to travel now, taking a couple of river cruises down the Volga and uh, uh, stuff like that, and uh, trying to stay abreast. I'm not that deep into sports, although I still follow them a bit. Um, how are you feeling? You feel good? I've been uh, very fortunate, yes. I've been in good health, and I'm Still staying very active, I hope mentally as well as physically. Now you're going to be 91 years old your next birthday. Oh heck, you disclosed that, darn it, okay. <laughs> Could you ever have imagined, looking back on your life, that you'd be sitting here now and had done the things that you've done? You know, you, I didn't think about it, no. It, uh, you reflect back now and you remember some good times, remember some disappointing times, but uh, that's in everybody's life, you overcome them. No, I, uh, when I first started out as an assistant high school football coach, did I ever imagine someday I might coach a team that's going to the Super Bowl? Certainly not then, no. Not one Super Bowl, four <laughs> Super four Bowls. Four Super Bowls. Don't tell, them, don't tell anybody how they came out, please. Is it possible to pick a highlight out of your long career? No, I don't think, uh, you know, that's like uh, asking me uh, which hand made the noise right there. It really, there were so many uh, memorable things that happened, so many people I was blessed to have in my life and to be able to coach and, uh, and know and so many wonderful places to be. I've been very fortunate, very fortunate. I served during World War II. A lot of my friends didn't come back. I was so fortunate to be one who did. I've always thought there's no higher honor than serving in the American military. Well, uh, I, I was proud to have been able to say that I did, yes. I went to two of the Super Bowls, Pasadena and Tampa, um, and just to be there and the feeling and the fans that came from Buffalo and the emotion and that team, I mean, you must look back with some really fond memories. Yes, I do, and every now and then, of course, you'll, I will, I'll, I'll see a tape of uh, those days of standing on the sideline as uh, Whitney Whitney uh, Houston sang the Star Spangled Banner during the Gulf War, the greatest rendition of that song I've ever heard, I believe. Uh, that's just one uh, trickle of many memories that I treasure. Um, a lot of high points in your career. Were there any low points? Well, certainly uh, there were injuries. Uh, there were times when my beloved parents were no longer with me that had passed away. Uh, but uh, everybody has some of those points. For the most part, uh, I've been very blessed. The people I know, the people that have supported me, and uh, uh, what the good Lord gave me to, to live on. Regrets? I mean, well, as Frank Sinatra said, regrets I have a few, but too few to mention. So I'll <laughs> leave it at that one. I won't sing it, but I'll say it. Will anyone ever take the same team to four Super Bowls in a row again, do you think? Well, I think it'd be, it's really un fathomable to go to four straight and again I, I can't change the outcome certainly I wish we would have won them all some of them one of them uh, we didn't but it, it's something that has not been done before but every record is made to be broken and maybe 600 years from now someone might who knows do you think the teams are better now or or not as good as what they were 25 years ago well I think everything evolves whether it's journalism medicine technology what have you um, so uh, there's more technology involved. We had, when I first came into the National Football League as an assistant football coach, the staffs had four assistants, really only three. I was the fourth when George Allen hired the first special team coach in the league. Now there are 20 some people on it. Um, but uh, no, I think uh, I, I can look back to when I was a youth when Red Grange in the 1920s played for the, for the Bears and said, wow, were they good. Uh, every era has its own great moments. I get the feeling, and I'm just a layman, that one guy who maybe didn't get the credit he deserved f when he was with the Buffalo Bills was John Butler. 
Oh, tremendous, yes. Uh, Bill Polian and I, when we got together at, at, at the beginning of our careers in Buffalo, recommended to Mr. Wilson that we hire this obscure USFL scout. But we had gotten to know and seen work and everything with John Butler, and he became our director of player personnel, and later after Bill left, our general manager, but he was outstanding. Great guy to work with, uh, and, and he, he brought such a flood of talent onto that team or recommended that we bring it on anyway. How'd you end up in the CFL, and was that a good thing? You know, in the CFL, I was an assistant coach at George Allen, and um, we went to the Super Bowl in 1972, lost to the undefeated Miami Dolphins, and somehow or other, there was a scout who had just become the athletic director of the Montreal Alouettes, J.I. Albrecht. And he sort of liked my coaching abilities, interviewed me, and they offered me the job, and uh, I took it, and it was a fantastic experience. And I got to learn a little French while I was up there, too, which I enjoyed. Didn't you live there for a while when you were younger? Your father was there for a while or something? My father was born in England. And at the age of eight, he and his siblings and his parents came to Montreal. And after a short period of time, they came down to the United States. So that, that was my previous history with Montreal. Other than that, during the years I coached there, that's when I lived there. And ironic that you go back to that same city because there are a lot of other teams in Canada and other cities. Yeah, that's right. It, it was the perfect one, though. I really enjoyed those five years there. How did you get so lucky to surround yourself with a Kelly, a Reed, a Beebe, a Reich, a Bennett, a Thomas. It's almost mind-boggling. Well, because of a couple of men that, that I've already mentioned and you've mentioned, John Butler, our, our director of uh, player personnel who did the scouting, Bill Polian, who was fantastic at uh, evaluating qualities, our general manager at negotiating the contracts, but the main reason Bill Polian and I approached Mr. Wilson the day I was hired, and he agreed wholeheartedly with the proposal we made. We would bring aboard on our team only players of high character. Now, that uh, personality didn't involve. Some might be extroverts, some might be quiet. But we, our mantra was ability without character will lose. Did they have high character? Were they good citizens? Were they team oriented? Did they not blame their uh, teammates, if something went wrong, did they go back to work after disappointment? So it was a combination. Uh, Bill Poley and I also stated, it isn't a great coach, it isn't a great quarterback, it's total organization that wins, and we were in a fantastic organization, headed, of course, by Mr. Ralph Wilson. Was it hard to find that character, and were you fairly successful? Uh, no, it wasn't difficult to find it. It just took a lot of work and insight and uh, finding out about guys. It didn't mean they had to be perfect or, or that, uh, that uh, not at all. But uh, it, it was an important aspect of our recruiting of, of players that we brought aboard. And as I say, their personalities were vastly different. Uh, Thurman Thomas was very extroverted. Other guys maybe more quiet, Both great, all great people. How did you end up in Buffalo? Well, how did I end up in Buffalo? <laughs> um, I had coached the Kansas City Chiefs for five years. We got incrementally better each year. I, when I went there, they were two and 14. Then we won four, then we won seven, then we won eight, then we won nine. It wasn't enough, I got fired. Two or three years later, Bill Polian was now the general manager of the Bills. He knew about me. He recommended me to Mr. Wilson Mr. Wilson called the owner of the Chiefs and asked about me, Lamar Hunt, and I'm very grateful. Lamar said, that was the biggest mistake I ever made in firing Marv, <laughs> so Ralph hired me, and the rest is history. Was that tough to be fired? What's that like? Uh, well, um, you know, if you're going to coach and make that your long career, it's rare that somewhere along the way, <laughs> you're not going to, you're not, that's not going to happen to you. Um, sure, it's no fun. Absolutely not. You, 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 you rue it very much. I enjoyed it in Kansas City. I enjoyed very much working for Lamar. There was one person in the organization who I believe just did quite a bit to undermine uh, my position there. But uh, 
you even, I have made up with him many years later. You're famous for your quotes. And one of the most famous to anyone in Buffalo who's been there for a while is, where else would you rather be? Where'd that come from? Yes, I can tell you, I remember that one very clearly. I was an assistant coach at the University of New Mexico. And after spring practice one year, our head coach, Dick Clawson, for whom I had played at Cole College, was offered the athletic directorship at the University of Arizona. He left. They couldn't go out and look for others. It was after spring practice, so they promoted me to the head coach at New Mexico. At that time, I was the youngest major college coach in the country. Forty years later, I tied George Hallett for being the oldest coach in the history of the NFL. But here we are, opening day, my first game at, uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the beautiful Sandia Mountains in the background, the band playing a fight song, pretty cheerleaders going through their routine. Players gather around you for those words that they never listen to uh, before the kickoff of every game. And so a sentiment inside of me, I just blurted it out. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? And that's what I said before the kickoff of every game I ever coached after that. That's why I named the book that. That's maybe why it's become well known. And I think you said it in that big rally in Niagara Square after the first Super Bowl you were in. Yes. Uh, that was an amazing, we, we lost that first Super Bowl, uh, Scott Norwood's kick wide right with four seconds to play, about that far outside the right upright. Uh, we came back to Buffalo and I thought we would be going back to our facility uh, where we had, had the wrap up information for the year, but instead they took us downtown to Lafayette Square, took us uh, City Hall out onto a balcony and there were 30,000 people down below welcoming us encouraging us and even chanting for Scott Norwood and Scott stepped forward a very uh, quiet man and just said you have given us the impetus to go back to the Super Bowl again so uh, I do remember that very fondly and what does that tell you about the fans in Buffalo New York well they are the best I've coached in a lot of cities I've coached everywhere and I've I've always found the fans to be wonderful but the, the Buffalo fans were a big part of the reason why uh, we were able to fight our way back and they helped provide the inspiration. Now, not everyone, some were critical. I remember a call-in show I had after we lost our second Super Bowl, Keith, where the man came out and said, Coach, don't go back to the Super Bowl next year. I can't take it. I, 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 I just, it, it beats me up. I can't go to work the next day. And he went on and on. I said, Sir, I understand your anguish. I share it, but I'm glad you're not on my team. But 98% of the fans were supportive. There's another quote that I liked that I saw. This is not a must win. World War II was a must win. Well, yes. It was at a press conference prior to maybe the third or fourth Super Bowl we went to. And when one of the um, uh, journalists asked me, Coach, is this a must win? And it's a game. Oh, we wanted to win terribly badly. It would have been wonderful. But it must win it went through my mind. World War II was a must win. And believe it or not, the next day I got a phone call from Andy Rooney, a famous uh, historian. 60 Minutes. Of, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and a uh, former World War II correspondent. Yes. Yeah. yes yeah. He what did he say? Well, he was telling me how much he enjoyed the comment and how meaningful it was to him. And boy, was I complimenting. It puts things into perspective, doesn't it? Yes, that is, I, that's what, I could have given that one sentence answer too by saying it that way. Um, Chicago's home, I guess, right? Yes. Why, when you came back here, when you, when you left your football career? Yes, well, I was born in Chicago. I grew up here, played high school football in Chicago, had tons of friends. My wife is from Chicago. Our only daughter lives in Chicago with our, our grandchildren. Uh, she has siblings, I have siblings, they're all in Chicago. Uh, tons of friends here, uh, so for a variety of reasons, I came back. Now that would be quite an argument if you were in a sports bar in Lincoln Park here in Chicago or in a sports bar in South Buffalo. What's the biggest sports town? I'm sure the Chicago people think they are and the Buffalo people think they are. Everybody thinks their hometown is, or almost everybody. and. Uh, uh, hey, that's one I, I, I'll have to dwell on. I am not 
they're both great sports cities. And uh, Chicago right now is uh, ecstatic over the Chicago Cubs, who are the best team in baseball right now, at least from the point of view of record. And uh, people keep hoping they'll get back to the World Series. And they've had a pretty good hockey team for a few years, too. Yes, they have, with a star player right from Buffalo and Patrick Kane. That's right. This is your home, but does Buffalo feel like home a little bit, too? Oh, absolutely. I loved it there. Jim Kelly said it best uh, because of the bad weather. And, and earlier, although it's coming back now, being a, a rust belt town sort of they're talking about, Bill, Jim Kelly said no one ever wants to come to Buffalo. And once they get here, no one ever wants to leave. He said it pretty darn well. Are you surprised that a Harvard-educated man like yourself ended up as a football coach? Uh, no. <laughs> I'm not surprised. People have varying uh, interests. I was actually in law school, and uh, my college football coach approached me and said, Marv, if you ever want to coach, you got a job on my staff. And that propelled me to transfer over to the graduate school instead. And, uh, a year or two later, I was back on his staff coaching, and I never regretted it for a moment. What do you have to be to be a coach? I mean, it, it, I know a lot of players come up and then become coaches. N many coaches are not, weren't players, but it must take a lot of things like leadership and whatever. Well, I say there are three qualities for every good coach. One, the ability to teach to convey, to get it across, to have the people you're trying to teach be interested, to buy in, to respond, to listen. Two, the ability to work well with others, because a good coach isn't going to win. It's a good coaching staff. It's a good good uh, roster. It's good total organization wins, as Bill Polian and I always said. And third, be a straight shooter. Don't tell some guy, uh, oh, if you come here, you're going to be our starting left guard. You might say, we need a starting guard. What we've seen in you, we, we like, we admire, and that's why I'm after you. Now come on in and compete and earn it. Uh, be a straight shooter. Don't make promises that you may have to back off of later. Do you keep in touch with uh, a lot of the former Bills? I certainly do. Um, a lot of them, uh, I've seen several of them when they come to town, they might give me a call and we'll go to dinner down at Harry Carey's iconic restaurant downtown. Um, and uh, certainly with former staff, Bill Poley and I, constant touch with each other. Many players. I had a 90th birthday party. Don Beebe and Steve Kasker came in for it. So, <laughs> yeah, I stay in touch a lot. I get the feeling there's a special bond there between you and maybe not all the players, but a few of the Jim Kellys and the Taskers and the Thurman Thomases. Yes, right, and, and more. Don Beebe, uh, you, I can go on and on. And uh, I do stay in touch. We exchange emails from time to time. And every now and then there's an alumni get together when one of the former players maybe goes up on the Wall of Fame. And, uh, but yes, there is a special bond. Yes, definitely. You were a father figure to these guys, I think. Well, I don't know what kind, but uh, <laughs> at least uh, we, we remain close now. We exchange uh, little uh, humorous jibes. I hope they're humorous. <laughs> What was Ralph Wilson like? Because we really didn't ever get a close look at, his, at him. Ralph Wilson was terrific to work for. No, he was no patsy. Uh, he, was, he was demanding. But wow, did he respond well to people who, who worked well. He was a total organization guy. He was straight as, straight as can be, as honest a man as I've ever met. Um, uh, he might disagree with you, but allow you to express your opinion. I remember one time, uh, if something had happened, he wanted me to fire two coaches on our staff. And I knew it was wrong, and I realized if I just stuck with it, I would either succeed in not having him fired or I'd get fired myself. But finally, at the end of the year, he said, oh, I still don't agree with you, but you're the coach. Thank goodness. Three or four years later, those guys were among his favorites, by the way. But uh, he was just, he was, he had opinions. We'd talk every Monday after we looked at the game film. Sometime he'd say, how come you're playing this guy? Or, uh, yeah, but he'd listen to you, your answers. And what else was he like? Those four Super Bowls, Ralph Wilson took everybody in the organization, the, the women who cleaned up at night, the security guards, the switchboard operators, 
took every one of them to the, to the Super Bowl game. Flights, hotel, tickets, meals, they were there. Was he disappointed at the outcome of those games? I'm sure he was. So was I. So were the players. Uh, but he was never, never bitter about it, never slam bang about it. Sure he was. It hurt him. It hurt us. He took some criticism from the fans and from the media. Personally, I thought it was unfair criticism, but, uh, oh, he didn't spend enough money for this, he didn't spend enough money for that, but he spent a lot of money, didn't he? Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, criticism is easy to flow, uh, and uh, it happens. No, uh, I, have, I have no, no criticism of him, huh? not at all. <laughs> Do you miss those Monday phone calls? Well, I, oh, I, I enjoyed talking with Ralph, honestly. Sometime after a loss, I'd say, oh, golly, you know, roll my eyes, here we go, because he might say, why are you playing this guy? Why aren't you playing that guy, Marv? And uh, he had sort of that voice that I'm imitating right now. <laughs> but uh, he was a guy I like, revered, think the world of, have fond memories of. You talked about character, <clears throat> not just in football, but in life in general. Any advice for the young people out there these days? Well, I, that, uh, advice is easy, I guess. It's like I say, ability without character will lose. So uh, it isn't just ability. Uh, work hard, <laughs> play hard, play clean, play to win. But win or lose, dig right back in. And that was something that I tried to get across to our players. Too. What is character? Hmm. I'll have to go get the dictionary, but I think most people know. <laughs> you can tell if someone's got it or if they don't, I guess. Yes, you can. And again, it's not based on personality. Are you still learning things in your life after all these years? I sure hope so. I sure hope so. Yeah, I've, I'm still reading and, uh, as much as I can and uh, going to lectures and... Uh, uh, trying to absorb, you can always learn. You're never, you're never going to come close to learning at all by any stretch. When it comes right down to it, do you think? What do you think is important in life? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> uh, because yeah. I think of that sometimes. Like when you're, when you're near, maybe when I'm near the end, I'm in a hospital bed or something, and you think back, what was really important to me? You know. Respect for other people is a certainly an important thing, even though they might be different from you in beliefs and heritage and anything. Respect for other people is certainly very important. Communicating. We're one of you, I, we're each one of seven billion plus people on earth, and every one of them is important. Are you happy with your life? Yes, I have to say I am. There's sometimes that I might slam the desk or do something like that. But overall, I've been an extremely fortunate person, starting with my parents and with the people with whom I've been able to uh, communicate over the years. Tell me about your book. Well, I've written several. <laughs> the last one, believe it or not, is a book of poetry, uh, original poetry titled It's Time for a Rhyme. And uh, one of my poems is Don't Call It a Poem If It Doesn't Rhyme. And uh, so... Uh, it, it's on a variety of topics. Maybe just two or three are sports oriented. Some are family oriented. Some are, are uh, character items oriented. Some are humor, I hope. Uh, so that's been several of them. Uh, one of them is called Honor the Game. And I don't know if you want me, if there's time to read it or not. But uh, A poem? A poem. Yeah, yeah. Honor the Game, yeah. which, is, uh, which reflects a lot of the philosophy I tried to convey to our parents and to our fans as well. So I will um, seek to read that one here if uh, sure. it fits right now. Yeah. And here it goes. It says, as we walk up the tunnel, we hear all the noise. Our hearts beat faster and we feel all the joys in knowing that the game is about to begin. We're prepared, we're ready, we wanna win. So do those fellows on that bench over there against whom we'll compete, but let it be fair Let's hope that both teams give it effort to admire and play by the rules as we grunt and perspire. Let us all be aware that it is truly a game. May both winner and loser know no shame. May we play every moment with honest zeal and for our opponent have respect that's real. When it's all over and the score is posted, let no one ever say that the winner is boasted. Celebrate or mourn for just a short while 
then go back to work. Make that your style. Play hard, play clean, and play to win. But win or lose, dig right back in. Honor the game. And if that's what you choose, no matter the score, you'll never lose. So that's the one, one sports-oriented one anyway. But really, that pertains to life. Absolutely. I'm glad that that, that, that resonated with you in that manner, yes. OK. What, uh, what didn't I ask you about, Marv? Did I miss anything? You asked me more than I know, I'll tell you. <laughs> Already. Um, let me think. No, you're, uh, you're really yeah. scared, Keith. Um, I, like, I think I told you, I went with Jim Kelly to. Uh, My hair is up. Oh, hi, how are you? I'm Keith. We're almost Fran. done. Hi. That's Fran. Yeah. Um, I went with. Ke oh, no, he talked a lot about them. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I went with Kelly when he went to New York about a year ago to have his chemotherapy mm -hmm. and his wife. And, yeah. and Frank Reich was there with him, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and Andre Reed showed up. I mean, it was really. Oh, yeah. These guys are like brothers. They are. There's a band of brothers with a World War II group that Stephen Ambrose wrote about. These guys are like that. Yeah, they're very close, very caring about each other. And I think you have a lot to do with that. Well, I'm part of it, and I hope I am. <laughs> I don't know, yeah. I think you top them well. Well, thank you, uh, if, if that's the case. They, I, I learn from them, too, as well as uh, the, the other way around. We got just a great group of individuals. They really were. Uh, final thing, for the people back in western New York, what would you like to say? Because we all love you, Marv, you know. What do you want to say to those folks back there who have gone to all these Bills games and supported that team and you for all these decades? Well, you say you love me, I love you. I love you folks. The greatest fans anyone could ever be blessed to have support your team. Uh, you were fun. Once in a while there was criticism. That's okay. Once in a while I criticized players who I liked very much too. And I bet you they probably behind my back criticized me at times. But to the fans of Buffalo, you are the best. I'm so blessed to have been able to spend my time there in that city and that area. Do you follow the Bills today? Not nearly as close, of course. Uh, for a while when I was back here I was doing some uh, pre-game, post-game broadcasting of the Chicago Bears. I almost had to be more into that than them. But I, I follow the Bills. I pull for them. I can't name their whole roster. I can't name their whole draft this year, for that matter. But yeah, I follow them, and I pull for them. Go Bills. Does it feel funny when you're watching a Bills game on TV and you're not there on the sidelines? Well, no, I understand that uh, things change. Uh, that things change. That's like asking Bill Clinton if it feels funny when he observes the president or something. I don't want to compare myself to the president. But uh, no, I, I just help, it evokes some memories from time to time, and that's good. It's been a good life, I think. Yes, it has, Keith. It's been a wonderful life, and I've been very blessed and very fortunate, and I'm extremely grateful. Marv, thanks so much for coming and talking to us. Oh. Actually, we came to talk to you. Well, you did. <laughs> and thank you. That's exactly what okay. I was going to thank you for all that trip all Our the way. pleasure. Thank you.